1 John chapter 5 and verses 14 and 15 we're going to look at this morning on the subject of prayer and having assurance in your prayer life. Now, for most people when they pray, there is a question in a person's mind. Is the Lord really hearing me? What assurance do you have that the Lord does hear you? That he even cares about what you're asking him. Think about those issues that you hold up to the Lord in prayer. Do you have that confidence that the Lord is hearing you and is responding to you? How can you have that? Notice here in this epistle, John turns from the subject of the assurance of salvation in verse 13 to now the assurance of answered prayer in verses 14 and 15. And in our next study, we're going to look at specific ways to pray. Very important. But first, you have to have the assurance that God hears you. How do you get that assurance? Notice what he declares, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now this is so important, I believe, that we stop and look at these two very short passages to help you understand what it means to have assurance in your prayer life. Now a person's prayer life is an integral part of their Christian life. If you have assurance of your salvation and you know that you are his, then that person is going to pray. That person is going to ask of the Lord the blessings the, and receive the promises that he has made in their lives. And yet, it is essential that a person understand the conditions that God places upon us to have answered prayer. Understanding these conditions will help you have assurance that he will answer you. And these conditions, we're going to look at them. There are five that I'm going to address this morning. But here in our text is the first and the most important one. Because this is the ground floor. This is the the place where you have to begin in your prayer life. You have to be sure that you're praying according to the will of God. Now you only have two options. Your will or his will. That's it. There isn't anything in between. You have a will. He has a will. George Mueller said that the nine-tenths of the problem in discerning God's will is that I have a will. And I would agree with that. Most of us here have a very specific will and a desire. But the question is, is my will in harmony with his will? That is the most basic question you need to ask. Because if it's just your will, then what you end up doing is trying to twist God's arm to do what you want him to do. And this is fruitless. It will bring no answers. It will bring no assurance in your prayer life. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is, What I'm asking, is it according to the will of God? Because if you do this, what happens is you have this incredible assurance that God is hearing you and is responding, that he is working. Now, think of it in this way, in a very practical uh, example. For those of you that have children, when your children come to you and ask you something, that is not according to your will, what do you say? You say, sure, you can have it. Or do you say, no, this is not going to happen? Why do you restrict? Why do you say no to some of those requests that are contrary to your will? Because you know that those requests are not healthy or not uh, a safe thing for them to do or 
something that's good for their life. You know that it's not beneficial. And so you say no. In the father's case, it is always for your best interest. It is always for the right thing to take place in your life. His will is always perfect. And so when the Lord says no, then you need to take that and believe that it really is for the best. In Matthew 6.10, Jesus taught the disciples that this was a paramount issue when they were to pray. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, this is a fundamental aspect of learning to pray, is determining what his will is and then praying in accordance to it. Because then and only then will you receive from his hand. Now George Mueller also said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. Now, do you believe that God is willing to give to you? Do you believe that God desires to give to you more than even you want to receive? I believe that is the case. Jesus said in Luke 12, 32, he said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. He desires to, it gives him pleasure to bless your life. But many times people don't see the Lord as willing. They see him as reluctant. He is not one that is ready to give, so we've got to twist it out of his hand. And this is the wrong way to pray. That is really against his clearly declared will. His will is to give to you. But you have to understand what his will is. In Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, Paul said, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you understand what the will of the Lord is? How can you understand? How can you come to know what the will of the Lord is. Well, it's right here in your Bible. That's where you find and understand God's will. And if we are to be wise, then we must understand His will. We must seek His face that we might have that wisdom that we need for the decisions that we make on a daily basis. Every one of us in this room are going to make multitudes of decisions this coming week. And those decisions will be in accordance with his will or they will be in violation of his will. And so you have that opportunity to make your decision. I pray that you will do that, that you will be asking the Lord for a heart to know his will and then to do his will. Very, very important. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's taking hold of his willingness. And he is willing. As I said, God is more willing to give to you than you are to even receive it. That is his heart. But whenever I bring this issue up with people, they always say, well, Steve, how can I know God's will? How, how can I come to that conclusion? I mean, don't, Every one of us here in this room, don't we want to know what God's specific will is for our lives? Of course we do. We know it's the best. But let me explain three different facets of God's will. Because you need this big picture of, of God's will and plan for your life. First, God has what's called his sovereign will. The word sovereign is a word that means supreme. And his supreme will is something that you cannot know. It is secret unless the Lord reveals it. Now, his sovereign will is his eternal plan for mankind. 
And that eternal plan will be fulfilled no matter what I do or what you do. His will will be accomplished. But it's unknown. It cannot be known. In fact, it is secret, the scripture says. The secret things belong to the Lord, except he reveal them. Now, through prophecy, we understand the rest of the story. We understand the end of all things. Because prophecy tells us what his eternal plan is and how it will be accomplished. And so God has given us insight into his eternal plan. Also, he reveals it through his word in very specific ways. He has revealed his eternal plan for the Jews and the Gentiles in Romans chapters 10 and 11. He has revealed his plan in the book of Ephesians to bring both Jew and Gentile together in the church, which Paul said is his eternal purpose. And so he reveals his eternal sovereign will in certain ways, and others we cannot know unless he reveal it. In Daniel 4.35, Nebuchadnezzar, after he was humbled by the Lord for resisting God's will, came to this conclusion. Referring to God, he says, He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Now that's a pretty clear statement. Nebuchadnezzar came to an understanding that no one can resist his will. He tried, and he was humbled because of this attempt. In Proverbs 19.21, there Solomon says, There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. That is God's eternal, sovereign will. No matter what my plans are, no matter what I try and do to change his eternal purpose, it will stand. It will come to pass. Then secondly, there is the general moral will of God. Now God's general moral will is revealed clearly in the scripture. It is fundamentally given to us there to have a complete understanding of his moral will for our lives. This moral will is given to us with every commandment that he makes and every promise that he makes if we will obey that commandment. And so his moral will is very clear. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, there Paul said, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And so it is the will of God that he sanctify, which means literally to make holy, to change us, to transform us. Every single one of us, that is his moral will, that we live and walk in a sanctified way, holy, obeying his commandments, which, of course, encourage that holiness. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Every one of us, this is his will for our lives. And so you will see this little phrase, this is his will, or his will is this or that, throughout the scripture, explaining to us what his moral will is. Then thirdly, there is the specific or personal will of God for every single one of our lives. God has a special foreordained plan that he has laid out for your life and for my life. And mine is different from yours, and yours is different from the person sitting next to you. It is a very specific, personal will. In Ephesians 2.10, it says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained that we should walk in it. And so he has an eternal, sovereign, foreordained plan for your life. Now you say, okay, that's great, Steve, but how can I experience that? How can I know 
what that personal, specific will is for my life. Well, it's really a very simple thing. We make too much difficulty out of this. And I talk to people, they call me, they come in and see me all the time about this issue. How can I know that this is the specific will of God for my life? I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to get out of his plan. How can I be sure? And I tell him, well, there are very, two very simple things to do. The first is that you just simply need to obey his moral will. And when you do, you will walk in to his specific will for your life. If you obey his moral will and then his specific will, secondly, then you will walk right into his sovereign will. You can't miss it because this is the simplicity of how to find God's best in your life. But the question is, is do you make those correct decisions to obey his moral will on a daily, regular basis? Or do you say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want. If you make that choice, I guarantee you, you will never find his sovereign will for your life, nor will you find his specific will for your life because you will mess it up big time. And again, I have to say, sadly, I counsel with people many times that have done this and they have struggled greatly over this issue. But the good thing is, the great thing is, is that no matter how far I have fallen, how much I have disobeyed, the grace of God can take that person if they will repent, if they will ask forgiveness and say, Lord, turn my life around. You know what he'll do? He will turn you right back into the path. That is the grace of God. What a glorious thing is that. You can just rest assured that he will get you into the right place at the right time. And I've watched him do it in so many different ways in my life and in other people's lives. It's amazing how the Lord works his work if a person will just simply surrender. Now, it says in Hebrews 5.9, here's the, here's the passages that prove what I've just said to you. Referring to Jesus, Paul said, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, eternal salvation is God's sovereign moral will. Okay? This is his plan. But how can you enter into that eternal salvation, that eternal plan that he has for you? He said to those that obey him. There's the moral will of God. Do you see it? Such a, a clear statement of how you get into that eternal plan of God. In John 7:17, 7, Jesus said, If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Notice that Jesus places the decision squarely upon your shoulders. Will you will to do his will? It's your choice. And see, when a person makes that choice and they, Lord, I want to do your will. Do you know what happens? They know. He said, you will know whether what I'm telling you is the truth or whether I speak on my own authority. You'll know whether the word of God is true or not true. Just choose to do his will. There is the moral decision you must make. Now again, when I bring this issue up, many times people will say, but Steve, I'm praying for my mom or my dad or my brother or sister or friend. And it's the will of God. It's God's eternal plan to save them, isn't it? So why aren't they saved? Why hasn't God answered my prayer? I've been praying for 10 years, for 20 years. Why haven't they been saved? It's a good question, isn't it? How do you respond to that question when it comes up? Again, there are two very simple answers to this. When you pray according to the will of God 
for something in your own life, there is no question about that. God will answer that. But when you're praying for another, another person, they have a will, and there is the problem. You see, every man must will to do his will. It's their choice. They must respond. They must yield. Now, when I pray for someone that I know is resisting the will of God, and they don't come, as many in my family have I, that I've been praying for for the last 32 years. You know what I do? I have total confidence that when I'm praying for them, and I do so every single day, I hold them up and I ask the Lord to speak to their heart. And you know what? I know He is speaking to their heart at that very moment. Can you, when you pray, believe that God is speaking to them? that he is convicting them, that he is, he is touching their heart at that moment. That's what real faith is. That's the way a true prayer of faith will sound like. Lord, I believe you're speaking to them right now. When you have that confidence, that doesn't mean that it, their heart is going to change or God is going to twist their arm or force them, but they have a will and they must surrender. The second issue concerning when you're praying for another person in the will of God is that God has his own timing as well. You will see this phrase throughout this, the scripture, in an acceptable time, or when in the fullness of time. You'll see these phrases where God speaks about his timing. Notice in Isaiah 49, verse 8, there, thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Notice the coupling together there of the acceptable time and hearing their prayer. You see, God has a timing for everything, and it's perfect because he has a sovereign supreme will that he is going to accomplish. And so you have to be patient sometimes because the Lord is working his work. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, there Jesus said, if any man will hear my voice and open the door, he said, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Notice Jesus places the responsibility, the choice of a person to hear his voice. So you just pray believing that God is speaking and pray that God speaks those words to them loud and clear, and he will. And, and pray that the Lord will touch their hearts with the reality of what they're doing. Now secondly, another condition for answered prayer is real faith. Now this is pretty obvious. It is an essential thing, and yet many times we don't pray in faith. I'll bet you every one of us in this room has prayed the prayer of unbelief. You, you know what I'm talking about. Lord, I hope, I pray, please, but I don't know whether this is really going to happen. And you don't really have that confidence, first and foremost, many times because you don't really know what the will of God is. This is why it's essential for you to determine first what is God's will. Then you can pray with total confidence that it is his will and have that assurance that whatever you are asking, he is hearing. In Matthew 21, verse 22, Jesus said this, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now people bring this passage to me many times and they say, well, whatever you ask in prayer, does that mean anything? Yes, anything in the moral will of God. Anything where God speaks a promise or gives a command. Anything in that. Now, I like this word anything because it, it gives you this, this huge space, this 
clear understanding that God wants to give you anything that is according to His will that you will believe Him for. Think of that. To Adam and Eve in the garden, what was the statement there? The opportunity, he said, of all of the trees of the garden you may freely eat. Just this one you can't eat of. There is the moral decision that Adam had to make. But think of it. All of the trees of the garden. Here's this huge, wide open space. And that is what God wants you to realize this morning is that he wants to give to you whatever you ask. It obviously is qualified, this whatever, by the will of God, by the statements that we've just made to you. But you need to pray in faith. It says in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, James says, Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now there's a pretty clear statement. If you're not receiving a lot in your personal life, could it be because you're asking in unbelief? You're really not asking in faith. Or could it be that you're asking in unbelief that which is against God's will? Very important questions you need to ask. Many times I think we doubt simply because we look at the, the difficulty of the circumstance. Don't you do that? I've, I've done that so many times. I think to myself, gosh, could this ever be? Could this ever happen? I mean, think of how long you've been praying, especially when, you go, when you're praying for a long period of time for some particular thing. You, many times you think, well, it's, it's this, I don't know, will this happen? How difficult is the issue. You see, but with the Lord, there is no such thing as difficulty. With Him, well, He declares there is nothing too hard for Him. But when we look at it in reference to is it hard or easy, that's where we have the difficulty. We have to look at it as there is nothing too hard for Him. Now, in Jeremiah 32, this entire chapter I would encourage you to read, maybe at a later time. But in verse 27 is a very interesting statement that the Lord makes to Jeremiah. To just kind of set the scene, though, Jeremiah is watching the demise of the nation Israel. Uh, the Babylonians have come and, come and taken uh, one or two of the captivities already, taken some of the children of Israel into captivity. And it's right at the very end of the nation. And the Lord speaks to him and says, Jeremiah, I want you to go buy a field from a certain man. And Jeremiah kind of thinks for a minute. And he, then he goes into this thing and he says, Lord, there is nothing too hard for you. He says, Lord, you're the creator of the heavens and the universe. Lord, you can handle anything. And he goes on with this spiel that the Lord is so great. And then he turns around at the very end of it and he says, but Lord, why do you want me to buy this field? I don't get it. Um, the whole nation is going to be taken captive because the Lord had already told him, the nation's going into captivity. You can't pray against this. This is my eternal will and purpose. It's going to happen, Jeremiah. And so Jeremiah knows this. So he's saying, Lord, I don't get this. Why are you going to do this? Well, the Lord turns right around and he uses Jeremiah's own words after Jeremiah said, Lord, there's nothing too hard for you. Well, this is what the Lord says. He says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I like that. You know, the Lord many times takes our own words and he sends them right back in our direction. You said this, but did you really believe it? And see, Jeremiah thought to himself, gosh, the difficulty of this, I mean, why do you want me to get this piece of land when everybody's going into captivity? I mean, will I ever come back here? Is what, what's the purpose? Well, the Lord was trying to work out a whole nother purpose in another man's life as well, and in the elders of Israel. 
It was to be a witness to them that Jeremiah did believe that God was going to bring them back into the land. So much so that he would put out his money to buy this piece of land. And so it was to be a testimony to them. But the issue of circumstances, are they too great for the Lord? Not so. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. And so when you start to think that it's too big, too hard, too difficult, stop and say, Lord, this is killing my faith because I'm not going to pray in faith if I think this way. Change my thinking. Faith, where does it come from? It comes from the Word of God and it comes from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. When, if you're struggling with faith today, get into the Scriptures because Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And in Galatians 5, that faith is a fruit of the Spirit. So ask Him to come and fill you with His Spirit. Ask Him to teach you His Word and bring that understanding of what His will is for your life. And then you can also ask for a gift of supernatural faith. Now many times when we pray for people that are sick, that need healing, or they need a miracle. I'm telling you, I pray this all the time. Sometimes I'll pray it out loud while we're, we're praying. Other times I will pray it silently as someone else is praying. I just say, Lord, give me a supernatural gift of faith. I need it. I need it for this particular issue. Have you ever prayed for the supernatural gift of faith? Have you ever done that? I hope that you do. I hope you do it often. Because a supernatural work requires a supernatural faith. And the Lord will give it to you. You see, His gifts, He desires to give, and they're within this boundary. Will you ask Him and believe that He'll give it? I hope so. The third condition for answered prayer is real humility. It says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, as God speaks to his people, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Boy, if we don't need to obey this particular passage of Scripture today for our own nation, and God requires His people to humble themselves, that is His first requirement, and then to pray, to turn from our wicked ways and cry out to Him and allow Him to forgive and to heal our lives and our nation. So essential. In Psalms 10, verse 17, there David said, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause their, your ear to hear. You have heard the desire of the humble. You see, if you want to have assurance that God is hearing you, you have to come according to his will in true faith with real humility. You see, pride is probably the biggest issue that keeps you from praying in the first place, from even asking for God's will and understanding of His will because you think you already know it. Or you really don't care because you want to just do your own thing. And the issue is, is humility is what helps me to see I have a need. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And Lord, I need help. That's what humility does. It brings you to a place to cry out to Him. It really is the cause of true relationship. This is the only way you come into relationship with Him. If you're to repent of your sin, you must humble yourselves and to do so. That's the only place it starts. In Isaiah 57, verse 15, there... The Lord says, Thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place 
with him. With who? With him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. What a statement is that? That is a promise that if you humble yourself, God will revive you and awaken you. And if you're, you're sensing that deadness inside your own soul this morning, this is how you can get a revival in your soul. Just humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm dead. I'm empty. I have nothing inside. Lord, awaken me. And when you do that, well, he says here that he will dwell with him who has this kind of contrite and humble spirit. And so cry out to him. I believe that great humility is necessary for great faith. And I, I come to that conclusion from one example in Scripture where the centurion, remember that Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8? And it's verse 8 and verse 10 where he, he came to the Lord and he said, Lord, my servant is laying at home. He is paralyzed and grievously tormented. He said, will you come and heal him? And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And then the man said, but Lord, I'm really not worthy that you should even come under my roof. He said, just speak the word and he will be healed. Well, Jesus responded and he said, I have not found such great faith in all Israel. Now, what is he referring to there? Well, notice the two things. First, the humility. He said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But then the belief that all Jesus had to do was speak the word. He didn't have to actually go to the house that he would heal him. Think of it. That's the most incredible thing. But great faith this man had because there was great humility and the assurance that God could speak and it would be done. If you don't have a humble heart this morning or if you struggle with pride, just it's a very simple thing to get. Just say, Lord, show me my sin. Show me my heart and show me your love. You ask the Lord to show you those two things. Keeps you totally balanced. Because when you see your sin, you're going to feel real bad. But when you see his love, you're going to feel real good. But your heart is going to be in the right place. Another condition for answered prayer is not harboring any known sin. It says in Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's not that he cannot hear me. It's that he will not hear me. Now this is an issue that, again, I find comes up in counseling a lot. Specifically when a person is telling me, I'm asking, I'm praying, but nothing seems to be happening, Steve. And I usually run through this, these conditions for answered prayer these five, and just go through them with them and ask them, hey, are you, do you, are you praying according to the will of God? Are you praying in faith? Is there real humility in your heart? And are you turning from all known sin? Usually at this point, a person kind of drops their head and they go, well, no, I'm not. And I'll ask them, well, what is it? And they'll many times will tell me, well, I've got a I've got, I'm holding resentment in my heart towards an individual I'm not forgiving or there's a conflict that's going on between myself and another person or I'm involved in some immorality, I'm watching internet porn or I'm you know, involved in an illicit relationship with someone and I'll say, well, that's the reason why you're not getting any answers because the Lord will not respond. You say, well, Steve, this verse out of the Old Testament, is that just an Old Testament thing or is it a New Testament thing? Well, let me explain to you. In Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Jesus said this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, 
Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Is that not saying the very same thing? Jesus is saying, if you know that there's something not right between you and another person, you need to go get it right. Leave your gift here. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to see you. I don't want you to offer anything to me until you get this right. That's what he's saying. In Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus says the same thing concerning forgiveness. Notice in this passage how he couples prayer into this issue because that's our theme here this morning. He said, when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your heavenly Father may forgive you. And then the next verse, he said, and if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So it makes it very clear. When I stand praying, I've got to stop and examine myself and make sure that there is, I am not harboring any known sin in any way shape or form. This is what it, Peter meant in 1 Peter 3.7 when he spoke to husbands and wives. He said there, Husbands, dwell with your wife according to understanding, giving honor to her as unto the weaker vessel, that your prayers may not be hindered. Isn't that interesting? You see, when a husband does not treat his wife according to the will of God, the moral will of God, or a wife does not treat her husband according to the moral will of God, it's going to hinder their prayer life. Is this an issue that's hindering your prayer life? I hope not. If it is, ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask Him to forgive you right now so that your prayer life may be restored. Number five, last here. Another condition for answered prayer is the glory of God. Now this is really the capstone of this whole study because it is the most fundamental motivation of your heart. You see, what motivates you to want the will of God? To humble yourself before Him? To address these issues of sin in your life, it's because you truly want to honor Him. You want to give honor and glory to Him. Jesus said, this is the way to get your prayers answered. John 14, 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now notice that word again. Whatever you ask in my name. That's the general moral will of God. Whatever I've promised you, whatever I've commanded you, whatever is in this, if you ask in faith from a humble heart, he said, that I will do. Do you have that confidence? Do you have that assurance that he will do it? That is essential. And why will he do it? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Is this your motivation? That the Lord would be honored. You see, whenever you love someone, take take it on a very practical level so that just so that you can get a little bit better understanding of this. When you love someone, don't you want them to be blessed? Don't you want them to be honored? Don't you want them to experience the, the fullness of God's plan in their life? Don't you want that, that blessing to come upon them? Of course you do, because you care about them. That's what true love does. You want another person honored and not yourself. But selfishness and pride is just the opposite. No, I want to be blessed. I want you to bless me. I want to be honored. I want to be known as the spiritual one. You see, which is a great hindrance in any relationship. True love always wants the other person 
honored and blessed. Notice what Jesus said destroys a person's faith. In John 5, 44, he said, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Think about that. He said, How can a person even believe when they're seeking honor for themselves and not seeking honor for the Lord? Their whole motivation is off, which destroys a person's faith. How can you believe if you're seeking honor for yourself and not seeking his honor? So is this a fundamental hindrance to your faith and to your prayer life? Is his glory, his honor, your fundamental motivation? I pray that it is. Now, God does want to honor you. He does want to bless you, but it is only after you have submitted and obeyed His moral will. This is His will to honor you. Notice what Jesus said in John 12, 26. He said, if anyone, that refers to you, anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. Think about it. But the requirement for him to honor me is I must serve him. That is his moral will for my life. That is what will lead me right into his sovereign will for my life the perfect will of God for my life. But I must surrender. This is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is simply teaching. That you need to present your body as a living sacrifice unto Him. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you'll be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That only will take place if you surrender your life fully into his hand, which will lead you to serve him and to follow him. Then, and only then, the Father will honor you. But to do that, you have to humble yourself. It says also in Proverbs 18, 12, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Do you see how each one of these particular principles and conditions for your prayer life is so essential? You see, you need to humble yourself before that honor will ever come. That's why a person wants to give honor to the Lord, because they've humbled themselves, they see their position, they see their need, and they're trusting the Lord to fulfill His will in their lives. Do you want His glory more than anything? Do you want His will more than anything? Do you want to trust Him with that humble heart, keeping your heart pure before Him? That's where you're going to find His best. You're going to find His will for your life. And when you pray, you'll have assurance that he's hearing what you're saying and he's answering.